ないですかグッドモーニングエブリバディハニーウェルカムトゥデグレイトレイクシンポジウムオンスマートグレイドアンデニューエネルギーエコノミーマイネームイズモハマシェヒダポーアムデディレクトルオブデラバー W ギャルヴィンセンターフォーエレクトリシティイノベーションヒアディアイティオンビハフオブデオーガナイゼンコミュニティアワントゥサンキューフォーチョーニングアストゥデイ for this important inaugural symposium. As you know, the topics we are exploring have enormous importance locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. Our country is going or undergoing a major transformation in the way we generate, transmit, and use electricity. Transformation will open new markets and opportunities for renewable energy developers, energy efficiency managers, demand response programs, aggregation technologies, and much more. This new grid will have a significant impact on the consumer experience in energy, creating cost savings and providing new options. Likewise, it will help the industry reduce its environmental impact, allowing us to move uh, uh, the new industry to reduce the, and allowing us to move away from carbon to leverage renewable resources and create a lean green grid. One of the main reasons I'm here today and that we are having uh, this great uh, conversation is because of the late Bob Galvin. Robert W. Galvin was a leader whose vision transformed the world more than once. His leadership at Motorola created the cell phone industry that revolutionized the way we communicate today. He's been a great friend to this university. Okay. When Bob approached me several years ago about creating the world first perfect power microgrid at IIT, saying yes was an easy answer for us. Bob's vision was to implement a model, smart grid that would never fail the end users, a truly pioneering vision. Back in the early days of Motorola, Bob knew that the best way to convince people uh, of the magic of cell phone was to build a prototype and show people what it was rather than just talking about it. We are following the same blueprint here at IIT with our prototype of the future of smart grid and microgrid becoming a, a model for the world. It's in Bob's honor that IIT has recently created the Robert W. Galvin Center for Electricity Innovation, where we are pursuing groundbreaking work in the generation, transmission, distribution, management, and consumption of electricity. You know, I met with Bob many times. He always reminded me of his guiding principle. He said, when I wake up in the morning, I always commit myself to doing something good that day. When I woke up today, I knew that he would be proud of us, all of us, for being in this room. There is no great, greater tribute to this amazing man than the work we are all embarked on today and the steps we are all taking when we leave this symposium to make his dream a reality. I think we are all doing something good today. I'd like to invite John Kelly, who is the executive director of the Galvin Electricity Initiative to make a few remarks. John. Thank you, Mohammed, and I'd like to thank the Illinois Institute of Technology for, for hosting us here today. There is no question that Bob Galvin was a man ahead of his time. His vision and spirit led Motorola to innovate beyond our wildest imagination. And then along with Kurt Yeager, he started the Galvin Electricity Initiative to encourage customers, suppliers, communities, stakeholders to rethink the way we use electricity. This conference is a testament to Bob's vision 
and we at the initiative want to thank all of you for participating. Bob sought to apply what he had learned through a lifetime dedicated to transforming businesses for the purpose of creating jobs so that families could lead a good life. And if you've ever talked to Bob, for him it was all about creating jobs for families. It was clear. He made that clear every time you met with him. He recognized that the electricity sector could be much better and that driving out waste through investment and innovation would create a sorely needed stimulus while improving the nation's competitiveness. So he recognized that the grid really was about being a competitive America. He proposed three key principles for how to think about transforming the electricity sector that we'll be talking about throughout this conference. And I, I think you'll see this theme throughout the next two days. First, apply total quality management and Six Sigma essentials to learn to innovate and achieve levels of performance not before thought possible. Bob invented Six Sigma and he shared it freely with GE and others to improve America's competitiveness. At lunch, you will hear more about how utility leaders are embracing quality management as a transformational tool. Second, provide customers with the freedom to choose. Think about how many systems have been transformed with that simple word choice. This included the US government, telecommunications, airlines, and even TV. Bob recognized that choice spurred investment and innovation, unleashing unimaginable value. For example, what is the value of being able to call for help from a portable phone, to talk to loved ones, or to create the platform that would enable the iPhone or iPad? Bob only hoped he could have seen the unimaginable in store for the electricity sector. And finally, develop standards and performance measures that ensure consistency and accountability. Without accountability, there can never be the kind of consumer-driven market transformation Bob envisioned. Bob Galvin appreciated the support and partnerships from many of you in this room who engaged with Bob and were curious about rethinking electricity. He was very proud that a team of industry leaders will carry on his vision through the newly formed Perfect Power Institute and the IIT Galvin Center. Together, we can deliver this vision with tangible impacts for the Midwest, the region and the nation. Thank you very much. And Bob, thanks you. Thank you very much, John. It's now my great pleasure to welcome to the stage the mayor of the city of Chicago, the Honorable Ram Emanuel. Mayor Emanuel has been a staunch proponent of the economic and environmental opportunities of the new energy economy. Throughout his career, Mayor Emanuel has been a leader in identifying and leveraging the economic development opportunities of the clean tech here in the Midwest, ensuring that we can capitalize on our strength. Of course, the mayor's office has been involved with other projects, including the mass transit investment, the water treatment infrastructure, LED lighting, and of course, the comprehensive recycling. Please join me again to welcome Mayor Emanuel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mohammed, thank you very much for that introduction. Let me, I know you're all here to work through on the issue of the smart grid uh, and clean energy. I'd like to highlight uh, a general view, and that is uh, that Chicago, particularly in Illinois, as you know, we have the highest concentration of wind companies anywhere in the country. Based here in Chicago, it's only fitting, given we're the, we're the windy city, we should have the most wind companies uh, based here. You guys are obviously very focused because that's a joke, okay? Uh, can we give this crowd some coffee? <laughs> or take them out to at least Second City uh, and have them introduced? Uh, but on a serious note, I believe all of us in public service are about investing in the type of key infrastructures that allow private sector companies like you to grow. We don't create jobs, we create the conditions for jobs and economic growth. And while there's a lot of debate about alternative energy, we were just having a discussion earlier, 
the biggest energy source is energy conservation. It's the fifth energy source, which is why early on in my own administration I announced we, while we have the most publicly owned gold LEED certified buildings in the city, anywhere else than anywhere else in the country, we're going to double that over the next four years. Mayor Bloomberg has funded uh, a project of mine called 10 Energy Zones to do energy conservation in our homes. There's a lot of public and private money for conservation and conversion of homes, both the windowing, the chalking, caulking, and the insulation, but to actually focus and bring those dollars that have been sitting on the sidelines and get them implemented, so residential conversion for energy conservation. There are other investments, and one of the projects we're going to be talking about in my budget, which is a major investment in our water, both our water uh, system, both in the purification, in the sewers, in the, uh, in also the water uh, pumping stations, but also encouraging citizens to put in the free water meter technology, which makes you a better conserver. Now that's not energy so much, but for us here in Chicago, as well as for the rest of the country, water is, is going to be in the future as important as our discussion about energy. And so continually making very smart investments so Chicago and Illinois can lead in the energy, energy conservation technology and be a leader in what I think are the critical investments. The next area is mass transit and making investments in our mass transit field, which I think are going to be very, very important for all the commerce that we think Chicago needs to lead in. Now, I'm pleased that the IIT took this leadership to bring this conference together. As a congressman, I worked with the Illinois Institute of Technology when we first got grant funding for the new battery technology, and one of the companies that came here is now a private sector company doing very well, just got not only public funding, but some great private sector funding. I want everybody in your field to see Chicago as a center for new companies, new technology, collaboration between the public and private sector so we continue to lead the effort in new companies that are looking at energy conservation, not just alternative energy, but energy conservation as the next fifth energy source. I believe that's the low-hanging fruit in the whole discussion about how do we see energy, which is conservation, whether that's our homes, our cars, but they're basically the way we lead our lives. And I'm glad, like Illinois Institute of Technology, has always been a leader in that public and private sector, uh, public and private cooperation and cooperation. I appreciate that IIT, Joyce Foundation, is hosting this conference and that all of you will see Chicago as that city that is looking to the future, ready to shape that future rather than being shaped by it. And the area that's most important is in the area of energy conservation. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for this conference. And again, I want to appreciate everybody for their appreciate and say thank you for your participation in this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for commitment to growing the clean tech community in Chicago. Up next, I would like to introduce Ellen Alberding, who will be facilitating our keynote panel. Ellen is the president of the Joyce Foundation. With her guidance, the Jones Foundation continues to be a leader in supporting important environmental activities throughout the region. Ellen is also a civic leader, serving on a number of boards, both locally and nationally, increasing the visibility and the impact of the Midwest on the national uh, conversation. We are honored to welcome Alan Elberding to facilitate the keynote panel. Thank you very much. That's me, Ellen Elberding. <laughs> if I make any jokes and you don't laugh, I'm not going to blame you. I will assume it's that I'm not funny, okay? Well, <laughs> Let me stipulate that. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to uh, and, uh, welcome everybody to Chicago, and I'm glad the Joyce Foundation could partner with IIT on this conference. We're going to have a conversation right now among uh, some extremely knowledgeable panelists. We're going to talk just about 45 minutes, 
and then there'll be an opportunity for people to mingle and ask questions after um, uh, Doug Scott speaks. Um, so we, we won't be taking questions right now, but there will be an opportunity later to chat with the panelists. Um, the topic today, obviously, is Smart Grid, and what I would like to do with our panelists is talk a little bit about what is the case, what is the Smart Grid, what is the case for Smart Grid, and what needs to happen going forward to make sure that the Smart Grid is, um, becomes an actual thing in our, um, in our country. So first, let me introduce Scott Lang. He is the chair uh, chairman, CEO, and president of Silver Spring Network. Um, which I understand is known as the Cisco of Smart Grid, but that doesn't really do it for me. Um, uh, they, they provide software and networks for the utility industry. Scott obviously has a tremendous amount of technical knowledge as well as lots of experience working in uh, regulated environments. He was an executive at Perot Systems, where working with um, Ross Perot, he was instrumental in developing systems integration, the systems integration business, both for EDS, electronic data systems, and Perot systems. Um, our second panelist and fellow cyclist who has not had a crash recently, but I have, is Luke Clementi. He's the general manager of metering and censoring systems for GE Energy's, um, <coughs> GE Energy <coughs> Services digital energy business. Um, which provides integrated smart grid solutions. He's a global smart grid expert. Um, he's also a consumer advocate, so I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about how the smart grid can interact with consumer desires and consumer behaviors. Uh, I want to start out with the basics, though. Can each of you define for me what the smart grid is or should be going forward? you want to start? Okay. Uh <clears throat> I would say that uh, when we look at it, uh, it's really the smart grid from our perspective is the uh, marriage of the actual physical grid, the electric wires, uh, to information technologies, uh, the digitalization, if you, if you will. Um, I would also make the observation that the grid really has always had some degrees of intelligence, uh, pr particularly around the area of protection and control. And, and that really brings to well, what, what is this uh, advent of uh, the smart grid and all the discussion that's been happening over the last several years. And what we see is that the cost of uh, sensor technology, the cost of communications has fallen very uh, drastically, which is really enabling the smart grid. Um, it, computers have obviously been around for a long time, but when you look at a grid, it's, it's very vast in its, in its reach and it's a very costly. To, or historically it was very costly, to put all the sensor technology out on that grid and then communicate it back so that you can actually start to create the intelligence. So our, our view is really what's happening is we're going from the historical grid with protection and control. Now we're going to move to the next level where we're going to put a lot of sensory uh, uh, sensors out on the grid, bring that information back, which then enables the creation of the algorithms that are going to allow us to optimize that grid. And that, I think, is the fundamental shift. Tell us a little bit about how your technology actually works. OK, great. Thanks. And again, um, thank you for putting on such a great conference. Um, first thing I'd like to say is it's great to be back in my home state. Oh. I'm, a, I'm a fourth generation farmer right here from Illinois, good, the great state of Illinois. And um, my father was a farmer, my grandfather was a farmer, and my great grandfather was a farmer. Wow. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing you learned about farming in Illinois was every great farmer gets the most out of every square acre of their land they possibly can. And that's about conservation. It's about putting things back into it and extending that runway the best we can with every square acre that we have. And it's funny how life, if you live long enough, life goes a full circle. Here I am in the energy business trying to figure out how do we extend the current generation fleet around the world longer by the application of advanced technology. Mayor Emanuel spoke about the fifth fuel. We couldn't agree with that anymore. There's nuclear and coal and gas. And the fourth you could think about is all the alternatives around wind and solar that are very important to our future. But we also have this fifth fuel about how do we get smarter about the power we currently already generate. And there's now, with the deployments, uh, we have about 8 million homes now networked in the United States. We have real case examples where we are seeing true savings to consumers 
and also to the kind of generation fleet that need to be built out. And we'll get into some case studies, I think, later on. But I, I, ex I, by chance, brought a little prop here. Luke spoke about the intelligence and the censoring and the networking technologies that are available now. And so this is an example of a network communication card that's a very intelligent device. It has an enormous, it has a lot of processing power, a lot of storage, a lot of uh, abilities to network. So not only devices that can think, we've had devices that could think for a long time from uh, thermostats to uh, meters to water meters, gas meters, electric meters, but now we can actually afford to have them talk. And when you can do that, you realize the impact you can make on the power we already generate. For example, if you collected all the energy around the world, at any point in time, there's 15 trillion watts every second of every day being demanded and used. And one thing we haven't cracked the code on is we haven't figured out how to store electricity in mass storage. It has to be used the moment it is generated. And so the amount of the cost for responding to peak power is going up. Everybody comes home, now they've got more flat screens, they've got electric cars coming onto the grid. So how do we distribute the use of that power through a 24-hour day and not continue to have to invest so much on that? And so when we do this right, when we put this platform in place, and let all of the devices that generate or consume or monitor the flow of power, we see real savings for consumers. So let's stay on this for a minute because Mayor Emanuel talked about energy efficiency. You're bringing it up again. Let's talk about this from the consumer point of view. In their house, every, the smart grid has been implemented. Everybody is talking through their little device there. What does it mean for a family? How do they interact with it? How does it change their behavior? Um, well, I'll use uh, Oklahoma Gas and Electric as a great example. They started customer outreach, community outreach, before the deployment ever began. And they informed people about a new rate structure and said, if you'll help us, we believe the impact could be we could reduce two peaker plants from our, from our plants and not have to build them just by using the power we already have, more intelligent and more efficient. And we're gonna give you the tools, however you want that information to come to you, when we need to tap into your thermostat or your home, we're gonna give that information to you real time. So it's your decision. You are empowered as the consumer. And if you need to override it, you can override it. And we've made that available through our portal, through an advanced portal. If they have access to the internet, they can get printed reports. If they want to see printed reports on a regular basis, then go online, see printed reports. They can get text. And so they find multiple ways to get that. And when they have that, and when they see that, they, they the respond consumer. to it. And 98% of the people are saving money and the satisfaction is high. We have an example, one of the schools in Oklahoma City saved $15,000 in the month of June and July. Now we all know how much that means to school districts and school systems. Businesses are coming back with real examples of how they're saving money. And so that's just one great example we've seen by a leader here in the United States of Oklahoma Gas and Electric is give people the information, empower them to make decisions, and coupled with the right kind of pricing approaches, it helped utilities to, to deliver better service, it helped the environment by building fewer generation plants, and it helped the consumers to be empowered and save more money. So what I'm hearing you say is you have to have the technology right, but you also have to have your messaging right. You have to be able to persuade people to participate, mm -hmm. whether it's based on savings for their community, savings for them personally, Perhaps some people are persuaded by an environmental benefit, mm -hmm. and figuring out that messaging is probably pretty important, both for, from the corporate side, but also from the public policy or elected official side. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Think about the Prius. You've seen the Prius effect. Those of us who live in California, there's a lot of Prius cars on the roads. And if you do a good job traveling from point A to point B, you get a smiley face at the end of the trip. 
and people really do good. And they have this little competition with the car. Did I get the smiley face? Although I've heard stories about <laughs> sad faces and people not reacting quite so well when they get a sad face. But um, Luke, t t let's talk a little bit about the, such a complex system. We can't do everything all at once. W where do you think we ought to be focusing our energy? Where's the potential for the biggest payback now that we ought to really be paying attention to, basically? Yeah. Well, we, we do look at it, and uh, we do take a very holistic view. So uh, we, we like to uh, comment, you know, from the GE perspective, uh, we, we touch the electron from the turbine to the toaster. So from all the way from, uh, from, the, from when that electron is first generated right down to when it's consumed, when, when we look at it, we also say we do break it down into really three levels of the, of the smart grid. There's the, you know, your transmission uh, grid, which is your high voltage grid. There's your distribution grid, which is where it steps down in voltage and for local distribution down to our homes. Um, and then there's beyond the meter. Um, and, and each of them have their needs. Uh, we just saw recently again in Southern California, massive power outage um, that took place on the high voltage transmission, which then uh, fed uh, into the uh, distribution grid and there was a, a, a complete loss of power. Um, very similar, reminiscent of what happened in the Northeast in 2003. Um, so there, there clearly is smart grid technology that's out there today that could, uh, that should be deployed to make that uh, transmission grid uh, more reliable. Uh, so that's an area that should not be uh, overlooked. Uh, in particular, the, the term we use is wide area measurement systems uh, need to be, uh, and what, what we actually heard when you go back and look at the 2003 report, the, the observation was there was a lack of situational awareness. And then when you look at the transmission grid, I think, you know, to Scott's point, this is where that, that, that grid's quite interesting because the, the, the transmission grid actually could afford historically to, to have a certain level of communications. They put fiber in in, in many cases, uh, but the distribution grid for the most part is really what we would call dark from a communications perspective. Um, we, we know about that uh, when outages uh, take place and so forth, uh, many of us, and I, I, you know, probably you know, don't appreciate this, but a lot of times when, when you're in an outage situation and you see that power truck running up and down your street, historically it's because they actually are looking for the problem. They don't have the tools typically to go find the problem. And by adding more communications in the grid itself, um, it allows you to basically isolate the problem, identify the problem, mobile tools for the workers so that they can find that problem. So there's a lot of things that we can do to reduce the number of outages at the distribution level, and that's where the pr predominantly most of the outages take place in the distribution level. We can also make the impacted area uh, less. And then lastly, which I think ties also into your last question about this uh, kind of, I almost consider it like the final frontier, which is beyond the meter, what's going on in the home. And I do think that we're very much in our infancy here. Um, and I would also make the observation that we're not going to have a truly smart grid unless it's complement it with smart regulations. And that's a very critical point. So I think back to educating the public. Uh, the public today generally doesn't know it costs more to generate electrons at <coughs> 2 o'clock in the afternoon and at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, so time of use rates are going to be something that I think is going to become more prevalent. Um, that's going to make consumers more aware. And I, and I also, my own personal bias is, and, that's, and that gets back to the business models haven't been developed yet. Um, I, 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 when I look at it, it's not clear to me that are consumers really going to be proactive in managing their energy or are we going to have very smart business models that are going to develop that are going to help them do it for them and, and be managing it for them. So th I think it were, it's yet to be seen. It's, it's in development. So, uh, Scott, you mentioned Oklahoma City as an example of a place where the smart grid is happening. Luke, do you have an example of a community or a state or a place that you think the smart grid is actually um, being implemented in a way that we ought to pay attention to? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I clearly see, uh, I mean, what I always notice about the smart grid, it depends on where you want to start. Some utilities have started on hardening and, and making more reliable their distribution grids and have put in the communications, have, are investing in things like integrated volt VAR control, and fault detection, isolation, restoration. So they're investing in that, um, which is going to, that, which is there's solid evidence around that can reduce the number of outages, the duration of the outage, and the number of people impacted by the outage. So that, that, there's some areas like that. On the, on beyond the meter, what I've seen predominantly so far has been some very good pilots. Yeah, I don't think that we're at the stage yet where we can declare 
that we've done a large deployment and we have you know, large penetrations of participation at this point. Those models are, are still under development, and I think, but I think the pilots are telling us some very good things that uh, we should be very encouraged by it. Like what? Well, you know, the one thing uh, that, I, that I see is, uh, is, is, is back to this, you know, because what consumers want to hear right off the bat, right? Consumers want to hear how does, it, it, how does it benefit them? How does it economically benefit them? And I do think there's, a cons uh, there's, a, there's an education issue there. Clearly, with time of use rates, smart grid is going to help them avoid peak, peak times and move to non-peak times. And, and it's going to drive that awareness that you don't need to run your dishwasher at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Or you might have the situation like we're seeing in California already with the EVs coming in. Utilities are creating favorable rates for charging off peak. So this is, this is going to empower Electric them. vehicles. Electric vehicles. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, electric vehicles. I'm guessing. Right, electric vehicles. Uh, but the one thing that I think another consumer issue that is not well understood by the public it's not only, when you say savings, the thing, and this gets back to Scott's point about conservation, the, the point is the cheapest electron is the one you don't use. The cheapest thing that we can do or the most cost effective thing we can do is to get more utilization out of our grid today. Because if we have to build more grid or if we have to build more power plants, they are clearly going to cost substantially more than the legacy assets we have today. So anything we could be doing to get greater utilization out of our assets today, and if you look at it today, most utilities today are working at around a 50% utilization rate. So if you, if you compare that to your typical factory, you know, most factories in the U.S., except, you know, when you get into an economic slowdown, but generally they're, they're looking to be utilizing those factories at 90% plus rates. And so that, that, re that represents a form of waste. And so to the extent we can use the smart grid to get full utilization out of that grid, that's going to, at a minimum, if not, if not save us money, forestall the increases that are coming. Let's, if, we, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about the technology. Tell, tell us a little bit about what Silver Springs products are that enables, I mean, you, you have one here, but tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about what it is that you provide that makes the smart grid possible. Okay. Um, you know, and I'd like to just also pick up, I, I met with a utility CEO a few months ago, and the meeting started with a high five. And they'd had an outage that morning, so that's usually not the way you would expect to have started the meeting. Um, but he said, you know, Scott, this was the first time in our 100-year history that we knew there was an outage eight minutes before the first phone call came in. And we knew where the outage was, why the outage happened, what kind of crew to send, and when the power was restored, we could bring the crew back to the field with confidence that we truly had restored the power. The cost just of one outage of it, and we saw a lot of the benefits from our customers that have deployed our technology on the East Coast from Hurricane Irene recently, of the restoration process and the amount of savings that creates is enormous. The consumers benefit indirectly from that. Forget just the rates and the, what we can get into a lot of business cases that we're seeing. On the technology side, we, when, when, the, when we started about nine years ago, um, there were enormous dollars going into the supply side of the demand curve, or of the supply chain. And around wind, around solar, billions of dollars were going into it, attracting a lot of venture investing, a lot of private equity investing. And so if the, the company wanted to play in that supply chain, but decided to play on the demand side. And you realize you can't get smart about how you use supply unless you get connected to all of the devices at the end of the line that are consuming or generating power. And you get smarter. And then we realized that the industry had been bridled by large industrials doing some proprietary things. And so this is on going towards the technology thing. It's important to understand what the starting point was when they created this idea and got it started. So we decided to go out and, and, and believe that standards ignite industries. Allowing more companies to compete makes the industry bigger and more exciting for more companies. And so that's what we did. We went out and built a standard base. We adopted this thing called IP, 
internet protocol v6 and brought it to the industry it had been proven in the banking industry and in the telecoms industry and every other industry but the utility industry by and large had been deploying proprietary networks so we brought in a standard based networking platform and that's what we started with is finding a way to ubiquitously connect every device in a service territory if i take pg&e as one of our customers in northern california they have 70,000 square miles of service territory some downtown San Francisco, some in a lot of very remote areas in the mountains and where there's a lot of snow and a lot of trees. We had to guarantee we were going to reach all of those customers, five and a half million of them, and have a network that's powerful enough to do more than just metering, but be able to do some of the distribution automation things that you're identifying of, or that you've talked about where we're saying how do you identify the line loss that's happening on the grid. So it started with a networking platform. And now we're building the software and the analytics and the tools on top of that. Um, but that's essentially, you know, a little bit about the technology. The, the, um, in the last 10 months, we've done 150 billion register reads from these devices. So you think about the power of that information and the usage of that information and identifying where there is line loss and identifying where there's opportunity to... Uh, to increase the efficiency of the grid. I just returned last week from the United Kingdom, or two weeks ago, and we're working on a project there with a utility that they feel like they can bring 188 megawatts of wind onto the distribution grid in a very small geographic area without doing any refurbishment of the power lines, just by adopting smart sensor technology on both ends. Because wind is intermittent, so they always have to tone it down a lot in order to have enough room for wind to come on because they don't know when it's going to come on. But by having intelligence on both ends of the distribution grid, 188 megawatts of wind without doing any refurbishment. At a full deployment, they estimate it's two gigawatts of wind can come onto the grid by having more intelligence in the grid and being able to pull on more and more alternatives. So I would say the technology is networking, it's software, it's services, and we've always recognized the most important bridge that we need to cross is this one between utilities and the customers and helping them communicate real time all the time. And GE, massive company, um, it's been around way before the smart grid uh, concept. How integrated is what you do into the, the products and business model at this big company where you work? No, no, very integrated. Um, you know, from, um, we, we actually, not only the smart grid is a, a key initiative of ours, but we also call the smart power plant as well, um, and, and relating them. And so I, I, when I, we're actually in the, in the wind business as well, and, in the, in the, and with our gas turbines, and we're actually looking at very intelligent systems that uh, look at this issue of intermittency of, uh, of wind and how you can integrate it with a gas turbine to make sure you're getting the right reaction at the, the whole time. Mm -hmm. But I, I, when I look at the smart grid, uh, particularly, we look at each of, uh, of the building blocks of that, of that system again. There's the energy management systems for the transmission grid. There's the distribution management systems for the distribution grid. There's the uh, geospatial information systems uh, that the utilities are using, the outage management systems. You know, GE sells each of those products, and our, and our clear vision is one of the feedbacks we've been clearly getting from our utility customers is one of the things I think historically that has uh, created challenges for them is that they've been really purchased individually. Now I think when we're talking about a smart grid, it really needs to be looked at as a total roadmap for the smart grid and those systems need to be connected. They need to be integrated and the flow of information between them needs to be shared so that they can create more optimization and that's, and that's the strategy that we're currently executing. So this is implied in everything you've talked about and you referred to, or maybe it was in Oklahoma City where they made a case that they would not have to build a couple of plants that mm -hmm. they had on the books. Let's talk a little bit more about the environmental benefits. What's the case from an environmental point of view for the smart grid? And I know it seems obvious, but right. what are the numbers? Well, well the, fir the first thing you'll see is that, I, I really strongly believe this, you cannot have this future we're talking about with electric vehicles and renewable energy without a smart grid, particularly when you talk about distributed renewables. So the, the vision that we're seeing about distributed renewables, California, again, I think is very much in the vanguard of this. There's tremendous rooftop solar being put on in California. 
Um, this is what the grid was designed. When you think about how it was set up over 100 years ago, it was designed with a large centralized power plant shifting electrons from high voltage to low voltage down to the home, one-way flows. Now you have this kind of brave new world that is very quickly coming to the fore uh, where you're going to have rooftop solar, where people are going to be selling electrons both directions, and we're going to have flows of electrons both directions. Um, it's creating massive challenges. California is wrestling with them right now. The, the, fortunately, they're in the vanguard again with the smart grid deployment, so these systems are going to have the capabilities to add the functionality to start to deal with the, uh, some of the issues that are being created um, or some of the challenges being created by um, distributed renewables. And same thing with electric vehicles. Uh, electric vehicles, I mean, this is the, uh, the introduction of the largest appliance to the home since the introduction of air conditioning. And if you go back and look at the 1950s and the early 1960s, air conditioning created its challenges for the grid. But the difference is these electric vehicles, even the smallest one, the Nissan LEAF, when it's charging, represents basically the, its, its, its <coughs> charge rate is the average size of two homes in America. It's a significant load. It has to be managed. And you're not going to be able to achieve that future, which, to your point, you know, to your question, this is how we're going to reduce our environmental footprint. If we can, if we can use more electric vehicles than, than the internal combustion engine, uh, what, we, what our statistics are showing us is that for the same amount of mileage, you know, mileage you're about 30% cleaner. Even when you, you look at your typical power utility and the, and, the, and the fuel mix they're using and the emissions that they're generating per electron for equivalent energy for gas, it's about 30% cleaner. So that's good for the economy. It's good for energy independence. It, it delinks us from oil imports. And then when you look at it from the, um, the, other, the, other, the other question on renewables, every bit of renewable that we can take and put it onto the system, distribute renewables, that's, a, that's an electron that we're not going to generate using fossil fuels. So that's very much important to this market. Yeah, I mean, even, um, you know, the, the power plant, the two power plant example from Oklahoma City, if that was rolled out throughout the United States, we estimate it's 150 power plants that could be taken off of the business plans that's in place. Mm -hmm. So the, the impact is significant. And I agree with uh, Luke on the electric vehicles. We have, we, I put a parking spot outside of our offices and we put a car charging station there and we started to see a Nissan Leaf park there and now we have three spots and I've told everybody I'll continue to dedicate spots and put power stations out there for anybody that wants to start driving up in an electric vehicle but the Nissan Leaf is starting to take hold and, and you know a little bit of a fun fact that I that crossed my uh, desk not long ago, was in the 1950s, it took one barrel of oil to produce 100. And it's 20 today. Mm -hmm. One produces 20. Unless you're in the oil sands and it's one to produce five. So that trend I don't think is going to change, mm -hmm. right? The electric vehicles and the investment that's happening there, I believe, is a great adoption. And so it's, a, it's, it's very exciting. I mean, this isn't, oh my gosh, it's, we're going to, you know, all have to sacrifice really comfortable lit life that we've all grown up to. This is about doing some really simple things to embrace some great technologies to help us with the 21st generation. I have four daughters. They're growing up expecting the grid to be smart. When they go to school and talking to their classmates, it's becoming a kitchen dining room conversation. And, um, and I think they're excited about it. We think of it a lot of times as when the internet started 20 years ago or whatever. It was mostly for email. And when you've had that ubiquitous platform out there for people to develop to, look at the commerce that's been created from it. The Googles and the Facebooks and the Yahoos and the Ebays and the Twitters. Hundreds of billions of dollars by opening it up in this industry and allowing innovation to occur. That's what we're doing here in the energy industry. We're putting in some intelligence by all the devices that are using and generating power, we believe that is the right thing to do for the utilities and for the industries. It helps them run a more efficient program. It's a great thing to do for the economy. I know there's a few, uh, few colleges represented here today. Um, we often go around and talk about the great you know, education and then the great careers that can be occurring in the energy sector in this smart grid and clean tech jobs. They're fascinating, they're exciting, the engineering talent, the kind of thought leaders we need to come into this industry are, are enormous. 
And so I would encourage even beyond the business and the policymakers, but the colleges that are here today, this is a fantastic field to get into and we need your help. And then last on the environment. The environment is a big, uh, a big winner. As, as Luke said, the EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institution, has done an enormous amount of analysis on CO2 savings um, by doing this right on a global basis. So pardon me for asking a question that's a little bit about the Joyce Foundation's interests. We're based here in Chicago, but our focus is in the Great Lakes region. We're really interested in how can we, um, how can we create an environment in the Great Lakes where we are leaders nationally? I mean, we've talked about California a little bit. Why do you think the smart grid, where, how do you think the, the Midwest is positioned vis-a-vis -vis the smart grid, and what do we need to do in order to either establish or maintain a leadership role? Yeah, you know, I, I think it starts with education. I think we've got to get a lot more uh, promo, uh, uh, awareness about what is behind the smart, smart grid. And for, for me, you know, I, I call them the, uh, the big E's, um, you know, that uh, economic competitiveness, that's part of the smart grid. Energy is a major input to any economy. Those economies that use energy the most wisely are going to fare the best in, in, the, in the global competition that we're now in. Uh, the situation, when you look, think about energy, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very challenging situation. Uh, we're seeing China and India and other parts of the world, their, their standards of living are going up you know, very, very quickly, they're, they're going, there's going to put more and more demand on energy. So energy is going to be, it's going to be a very hot, hot subject. Um, when we think about this environment, uh, about this uh, renewables and, and, and electric vehicles, um, I always call it, it's a, it has a double uh, arbitrage. It, it really allows us to uh, keep more wealth in the community uh, instead of uh, having those high, you know, uh, hydrocarbon dollars leave the community and go some offshore to somewhere. Now we can locally generate, create more local jobs. Um, so that, that's, that's good for the economy. And the second arbitrage is the environmental one. So it, it's going to be better for the, uh, on, the, on the impact of the environment. Um, the, the other one is the empowerment of the consumer. The, 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 clearly, uh, the world's changing. The millennials, you know, your daughters, I'm sure I have, I have two as well. And, uh, and they're very, very uh, aware. They want to be part of the decision making. It's, you know, we're seeing it everywhere, right? It's the democratization of everything, right? They're not going to uh, allow you know, the, the, you know, their, their utility to make their decisions for them. They're going to want to be part of that decision making. They're going to want to have the information uh, to, ma to, make those, uh, to make those decisions. So, um, you know, I, th so I think you know, that, that is the where that most help can come in because awareness, I think, will then drive policy. So I think when, you, when we, we talk about the smart grid, we should be always talking about economic competitiveness, energy security, uh, empowerment of the consumer, and the environment. I'm laughing thinking about these daughters. I, I had a <laughs> daughter in her first apartment last year who came home and went to turn the lights on and they didn't go on. So she, she calls me and said, well, the, the lights aren't on and I can't plug in my computer. And, and I said, well, what do you think happened? Did you pay the bill? <laughs> oh, the bill. <laughs> and so she hadn't paid the bill. Then she had to go out and read the meter. She didn't know there was a meter. So I think your daughters are more sophisticated than, than mine, perhaps. In we talk a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> I took them. I, remember, I gave them a story when I was when I was a young boy. You know, we're all about energy. We're all about efficiency. And my dad would take me out to this spinning flywheel on the electric meter, and my mom and my sisters. And he'd say, "Our goal. We got to slow that meter. We got to slow that down." Right? And I will know what's going on in the house. That's when I walk in, activity. I'm going to watch that. that. <laughs> Maybe at Thanksgiving oh, we'll go out there. He was, he was a true, let's get everything we can out of everything we put into it. And so I don't take my, I don't, haven't got that extreme yet <laughs> to go outside and show my daughters the electric meter. But we are getting tools of in the home of how they understand what's going on. And I think this generation, there's no way you think ahead 10 to 15 years. Just pick a number out there. This generation is going to expect the utility to know when their power's out, providing a better service, giving them more information. There were two, there were average of two devices plugged in for every home in 1950. Today, on average, there's 25. And it's estimated to double again in the next 10 years. Let's go back. I want to go back to the Midwest, though. What yeah. are the, um, I mean, there, there, there also needs to be a policy environment that makes it possible for you to succeed. 
Um, can we talk a little bit about what that environment might be, what's required? Is there something at the federal level that could be done? And if not, then let's talk a little bit about what should be considered at the state level? Yeah. I mean, from my, I guess, again, one of my strong um, points that I like to make is, uh, you know, I do think that time of, uh, you know, we first got to create a market. And I think, again, what we have today, on uh, the way tariffs are put together, um, we are, in essence, uh, encouraging the, the misuse of the resource because it, it's a flat rate. It doesn't really matter what, what time of day that, that we use mm -hmm. it. So from a policy point of view, I do think um, uh, time of use rates will, will be a, uh, a major uh, catalyst for change. I think there, there are also going to be time of use rates are critical now when we start thinking about uh, the, the inter, uh, introduction and integration of electric vehicles. Uh, because if, if people start buying electric vehicles and start coming home at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or, and plugging them in, that, that, that's going gonna, gonna to make our challenges worse. And, and as to Scott's point, that, that's not going to avoid the building of uh, peak power plants. That's going to encourage yeah. the building of peak power plants, which is going to add the cost. Yeah. So I think making sure that we have a market and, and we drive awareness and, and education is, is where, where I'd be applying my focus. I think, I think the policy, I think that's right. The, t the time of use, uh, the, everywhere that's been adopted, it's made a great impact. I think that for, by and large, every utility I visit in the United States want to make this happen. And by and large, the commissions and the regulators are coming around that and rallying around that and understanding the facts and the details. There are still areas where there's a bit of a reluctance to really get the facts right. And I, I think that we're starting to see all the directions go in the right direction here in Illinois. But where there is this solid relationship between policy and regulators and the utility industry and the facts are on the table, change starts to happen. Everybody gets on one sheet of paper and one common sheet. And, uh, and I think by and large we're seeing a true pull and uh, to, for that to happen. I w I've always um, believed that this is ultimately where we need to go. So, and I also believe the, uh, the school environment here, the education environment is second to none. I mean, the state of Illinois has some of the best schools, and best colleges, universities in the entire country, and especially right here in, in northern Illinois. And I think to get them as one of the key stakeholders in this of education and awareness is very important. So that's why I was really happy to see that, uh, that group represented today. And a question I've been wondering about, do you, do you feel like there is a general plan that people all understand? And can this smart grid be implemented all at once? Or does it need to be step by step? And if it's step by step, what are the steps? Yeah, we see the smart grid as a journey, and, and, and there is a vision around it. Um, I, I think, again, some of the technologies are under development uh, today, um, and, and I would say that you can clearly, uh, there's clearly tools today that, first of all, to add uh, more communications, more intelligence, more advanced algorithms to the distribution network is, is an area that's very hot right now, um, making substations more intelligent. Um, and automating substations, that, that's an area that's very, very active right now. The smart meter deployments mm -hmm. are, are very active. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, I think there's still development uh, underway as far as the, uh, what's going to go on beyond the meter and the business model developments. And, I, and I, I agree with Scott that it feels a lot like the Internet, that we're creating the capability, we're creating the foundation, and there's going to be a, a lot more creative people coming into the space and, yeah. and actually trying to leverage that infrastructure. So that, that's, that's, that's on its way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah great. Yeah, okay. It's a journey. I mean, there's not one day you wake up to a smart grid. It's truly a journey that uh, utilities go on. I think there's a couple of really key things. Utilities recognize this relationship. They have to cross this bridge. The industry's never crossed. But building a communication with their customer. You know, the industry grew up referring to their customers as rate payers. Right, and then I would have a group of uh, a meeting with a group of other executives, and they say, "Scott, it was worse than that, because we refer to them as load on our system." <laughs> <laughs> and so you see, the industry for a hundred years has really just thought about universal access to power, and they never wanted the phone to ring. And now people want to have a better service and more real time, and utilities need to have connection. 
to those devices that they are responsible to provide a service back to you. And it starts with that. It starts with the consumer education, that outreach. And then it starts with building the right communication platform that can handle all the different needs of the people. And that will take uh, time and uh, to allow and enable electric vehicles to come onto the grid and handle the intermittence. Because mm -hmm. it will become in little pockets where there could be multiple electric vehicles on one circuit down one street. Because it's a Jones, keep up with the Joneses factor, right? right. Well, my neighbor got one. I want one. And so it wasn't two in a zip code, it was two on the same street and in the same circuit. So I think it's also, I agree with Luke, I think it's a journey and I think it's step by step. But it starts with consumer outreach and it starts with putting in the right platform in place that you know is going to be flexible for the future. Well, on that note, I want to wrap this up and thank you. What a fascinating set of experiences and knowledge you bring to this. And um, I've learned a lot, and I hope everybody in the audience has as well. Look forward to interacting with you afterwards. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you, Ellen. We really appreciate the presentation. That was great. Now, let me introduce uh, and welcome Doc Scott to share his perspective on how we can leverage regulatory bodies to facilitate the deployment of smart grid technologies across the region. Thank you. Currently, he serves as the chairman of the ICC, the Illinois Commerce Commission, a long-term leader in the energy and environment sector. Chairman Scott previously served as a director of the Illinois EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, while he was a director of IEPA, he also chaired several key committees that focused on how to mitigate the effects of climate changes both within Illinois and across the region. Chairman Scott also served uh, and had elected offices as a state representative from the 67th District of Illinois, and then he served as the mayor of the city of Rockford. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Scott. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you very much. Good morning. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to be here. I appreciate the chance uh, to be here with you and, and take just a few minutes to discuss this, uh, this really important issue and to do it from a perspective, the Midwestern perspective and an Illinois perspective and then also uh, from a regulator's uh, perspective as well because we are uh, not only important but I think necessary to this, uh, this process as well. Uh, I really appreciate IIT and the sponsors for putting this, this event on uh, and especially at this time because it's, it's such a, a, an issue that's uh, at the forefront here of discussions in Illinois and it's a great time for us all to be uh, discussing this. Um, I also do uh, with uh, uh, want to welcome you uh, as an Illinois official. I want to welcome you to Illinois and also to Chicago, uh, to the Windy City, and in deference to the mayor. Uh, and having been one, I always have deference for the mayors. Uh, but to remind uh, all of us that Windy City, I think, is a political and not a meteorological appellation. So um, that was good. That was that was also a joke. So very good. Thank you. So I want to talk uh, for just a few minutes of, uh, really about, about three things. One is the, the smart grid itself and some of the advantages, and I won't spend a lot of time there because you've already heard through that, that great panel that just uh, preceded me uh, a lot of the advantages that are out there. Uh, but also then to talk about it from a Midwestern perspective and then the regulator's perspective because I think that, uh, uh, as I said, they we're, uh, we're going to be necessary to the process both geographically in the Midwest and here in Illinois and then also from the, um, from the ICC and the regulator's perspective. So as, as Luke and, and Scott pointed out to you in the, in the last uh, uh, panel, there are a lot of great front-end advantages to smart grid. I mean, one of the, the great... Uh, awakenings for me was uh, being mayor in, in 2003 in Rockford and having a major outage where we lost power. Rockford's a city of about 150,000. Uh, three quarters of the city was without power for multiple days following a straight line wind storm that was really uh, very severe. Uh, and the utility company kept saying, you know, please call the utility company, please let us know when the power's out. And I'm like, well, how can the utility company not know that the power was out in any particular place? But as you've heard and as you know, 
that isn't the case. And, and as was pointed out, uh, the, the advantage of having uh, better technology on the front end can, can really uh, uh, have some great benefits for the companies in terms of their responses, uh, both once an outage happens and even maybe perhaps more importantly before an outage happens to understand where there are some problem areas. From the other aspects, though, that are, that are very important, and some of these were, were pointed out as well, uh, as we're moving, hopefully, toward a more low-carbon uh, economy, uh, smart grid and the technology there plays a, a very vital role in, in a lot of that work uh, as well. And as you heard, I've spent a lot of the last several years working on those particular issues, uh, not just from IEPA's standpoint, but working with regional uh, and national groups uh, on this issue. Uh, Building additional power plants is a very difficult proposition now just from a, uh, an economic as well as from a, a siting perspective uh, and the idea that uh, we'll be able to build our way out of this, uh, out of the coming uh, demand uh, upside that we see coming in, in, in the next few years, uh, it really isn't very realistic and so it makes more sense uh, just practically as well as environmentally that, that we do more uh, in terms of demand response, we do more in terms of energy efficiency and some of the things that the Mayor Emanuel was talking about, uh, about earlier. Um, the consumer empowerment and education I think is, is both a challenge that, that we have to work on as you heard but it's also one of the, the great offshoots of, of working on the smart grid because really by giving consumers more choices uh, and more opportunity to control their own destiny in terms of their power usage I think that has some, some very good benefits uh, for us uh, as a society. Uh, it facilitates uh, introduction of things like electric vehicles uh, as we've heard the market uh, penetration there uh, and also the development of, of new technologies and efficiency, creating efficiencies in other contexts as well and with other industries. Uh, we've already seen some of that go on here uh, in Illinois over the last several years. And very importantly, uh, and something that we look at all the time, the ability to shift the demand curve uh, away from the, the 2 p.m. peaks uh, that, we, that we talk about. Uh, also has a major impact potentially on fuel mix. Uh, if we're able to shift demand away from, from 2 p.m. and into a little bit more of 2 a.m., uh, for example, that's when the wind blows uh, more and when we know from, from the wind uh, generation that we have in this state and in several others uh, that if we can get that onto the grid and get it being used at that particular time, that can have a major impact not just on power usage and peak demand but also going back to the environmental theme that we talked about just a minute ago. So why is the Midwest important, uh, aside from those of us who just think generally the Midwest is important because we, we're either here, we live here, or we work here, uh, or we have a lot of business here. Uh, but there's a lot of other reasons why making sure that this happens in the Midwest becomes very important, I think, uh, nationally as well as for us here, here locally. Uh, the climate, the, the, what, what, we, what we deal with here in the Midwest in, in terms of climate, in terms of having both tough winters and tough summers uh, from power usage standpoint, uh, I think makes it uh, a, a particularly uh, a good place for us to, uh, to work on this. Our population size and the population base that we have in the Midwest, especially here uh, in the Chicago area, a tremendous mix of urban, suburban, uh, and rural so that, that rolling these kinds of programs out, we're able to, to do that. In, in all kinds of different settings. Uh, we have multiple um, uh, RTOs, uh, the, the people that make sure that the, the power gets uh, uh, onto the grid uh, and gets distributed in the right way. We have multiple op RTOs operating here within Illinois and in the Midwest, which means that what we do here has connections not just with the Midwest, but with many other states that are covered by those RTOs uh, as well. Uh, Illinois is a major coal development state, and so you see us included in, in a lot, as are other states in the Midwest, but you see us included in a lot of the national discussions from an environmental standpoint and trying to figure out uh, with how those environmental um, issues are going to affect us here in Illinois, a uh, broader shift toward low carbon technologies that makes sense for us to be a major player early on uh, with this technology. Uh, we have a lot of older infrastructure, uh, a lot of older infrastructure that needs to be upgraded, and so it makes sense to upgrade it in the smartest way possible. Uh, we're an energy epicenter here in, in Illinois, uh, everything from transmission to pipelines, rail, roads, uh, just about everything that, that uh, uh, you've got here uh, comes through Illinois and certainly through the Midwest. Um, and, you know, obviously the, the 
political environment and political influence of, of Illinois is very important both in the in the region and, and nationally uh, and even with some of the disagreements that that we've been having recently uh, in, the, in our legislature about this particular subject uh, it's more uh, of disagreement about how to do it uh, not so much about whether or not smart grid makes sense and 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 even in that even in that disagreement the discussion about the issue and the amount of time that we're spending talking about it with legislators with the public with other elected officials throughout the state uh, I think it's very helpful um, as well uh, and the ability of the Midwest to be important on the national debate can't be under uh, can't be overstated I'm sorry and I found this out from doing the climate work that we did and when the Midwest uh, was starting to form a group to look at, at regional cap and trade programs uh, we were invited to everything and I you know and as as some members dropped out and Illinois kept going and we kept participating I was getting invited to everything and I finally found out that it wasn't my personality uh, they didn't like having me around so much as it was it was important to have the Midwest in the room uh, because a lot of what happens from a policy standpoint is driven on either one of the coasts it makes it very important for for the Midwest uh, to play an active role and and really it can't be overestimated how important that is on the national level when you look at a lot of the policies that are being debated now in Washington from an energy perspective a lot of that's being driven by interests that that are really important uh, in the Midwest and whether that's looking at the biofuels uh, debates and some of the subsidy programs that happened before or whether you start talking about other energy programs as it relate to climate or other EPA regulations uh, a lot of the interests of the Midwest become very, very important uh, to that. Uh, and in, in the Midwest, and especially in Illinois, uh, we've had uh, some restructuring that's gone on. We now have a competitive marketplace uh, for, for generation uh, here in Illinois. And, uh, and uh, we are uh, approaching, uh, obviously, from a market-based approach there, but we're also approaching things like electric vehicles from a market-oriented uh, approach as well. And obviously, this fits in very well uh, with that. Uh, we've had real-time pricing here uh, since uh, 2003. Uh, in Illinois, uh, and although the the, uh, the the we've had regulatory and legislative approval of the idea of dynamic pricing, and 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 very little, honestly, very little controversy uh, about that. And the programs are still small, and maybe that has something to do with my my previous statement. Um, and we need to definitely have some technology upgrades to that. Uh, I think what that's demonstrated, though, is that there are residential customers here uh, that are embracing the idea of dynamic pricing and will change. Uh, their energy use. Uh, the issues here, I think, are going to be more about how we expand and how can we make the value proposition either more evident or how can we make it more worthwhile for more consumers uh, to take part and not necessarily whether that's a good idea uh, in the first place. And so I think that's, that's uh, very positive as well. So there are a lot of reasons, and I know I've left some out, but there are a lot of reasons why it's very important uh, to both capitalize on what's been done in the Midwest and also to try to advance the Midwest, as, as Ellen was getting to with the panel, uh, to talk about the Midwest as a leader uh, in this field. So the role, role of the public utility commissioners, both in Illinois and in the other states in the Midwest, uh, is also very important as well. And we basically serve two functions uh, in, this, in this area. One is, of course, as a regulator, um, which was interesting for me to learn, having been a very political person, as you've heard, for the last uh, 25 years or so, to learn that there's a great deal of what I do that I can't talk about to anybody uh, because we have a quasi-judicial role in, in terms of utility regulation. But there are also areas, uh, and obviously a lot of that role becomes very important to smart grid uh, and, and advanced technology, but also as a role of a convener, as a public policy convener. And, and prior to, to me getting here uh, at the commission, back when I was with EPA, the ICC actually was a, was, uh, had been a leader uh, in terms of the smart grid, uh, starting the smart grid collaborative and doing about a two-year process of bringing together stakeholders uh, working through all of the issues that are involved uh, uh, with Smart Grid um, and bringing a very diverse group of, of people together whose interests uh, may 
they, they may talk about the same issues, but generally it was either in an adversarial way or they may have been in different silos and never actually did talk to each other, even though they did have commonality of interest on this and, and other issues. So uh, we had a uh, docketed uh, proceeding that we were set to initiate after the collaborative was over. That was one of the last recommendations, but some legislative uh, events have, have kind of stopped that for now, but um, the, I, the, the work behind the Smart Grid Collaborative is, is out there for, uh, for folks to be able to to, to take a look at. So the Smart Grid Collaborative as well as our electric vehicle initiative that uh, we've, we've rolled out uh, as well that we're working on right now, uh, talking about all of the issues, a lot of them are the same ones. What's the impact on the grid? What's the impact on power usage? How do the consumers relate to this? Uh, what's the best way to try to roll this out? We're working on that issue as well right now, again showing that the, that the commission, in addition to doing a regulatory duty, uh, also has a, a, a very large role uh, as a convener. Um, I think that, that how all of this happens, how all of Smart Grid rolls out, and I, I think you, you could get that flavor from the last panel as well, how all of this happens is incredibly important to the success uh, of it. Uh, and so how that happens from a regulatory standpoint obviously is, is very important to us as well at the Commission and to the other public utility commissions uh, in the Midwest. So, early involvement of the public utility commissions, even if, if, if in your states they're not the conveners of the action or not the people starting the dialogue, it's very important to invo involve them because they are going to have to make some significant rulings with respect to this uh, as we go on. And I, I think you know, there's, a, there's a difference too between states that have competitive markets and uh, for energy generation and those that are vertically integrated. Uh, but I think on this particular issue, a lot of those issues are not only the same, but a lot of the same kinds of considerations that go into uh, trying to figure out uh, uh, who should pay for new energy generation, what the appropriate and the reasonable and prudent costs of that are, how those costs should get spread out. A lot of those issues that people deal with in vertically integrated states that we don't anymore in Illinois with respect to power generation are the same issues that areas where there's disagreement. We have the understanding, as did all the parties, of where those, where those issues and where those differences lie. And it always makes it a little bit easier uh, to work on those issues once you've had that uh, a little bit better, uh, better defined and some clarity uh, on that. So one of the major parts that's important to this um, is, is also the, the rollout of this and, and how that's done well. Uh, and you heard that over and over in the last panel, and I couldn't agree more that consumer education uh, is very important to all this. Uh, even from the beginning of starting off, and I'm glad Ellen started off this way with the idea of what is the smart grid, because having, having gone through a, a legislative discussion on smart grid most, most recently in our legislature, uh, I think you can find as many different opinions or as many different definitions as people that you run into. And so it's very important uh, from, a, from an education standpoint to define exactly uh, what we're talking about. But, most public utility commissions are, are situated just like we are here in Illinois, where you really have two distinct roles. One is to make sure that the power uh, gets to the customers in a reliable and a safe way, that the companies are able, and that the companies that, that supply the power are able to do so uh, in a way that, that's going to allow them to continue to do it. In other words, the companies have to be uh, set up and the, the commission rulings have to be such that, that they're able to, to continue with that business operation. That's one half of it. The other half of it, which is, which is very important as well, is that the customers, at least the way that we're set up, uh, shouldn't pay any more for that than they have to. Uh, that, that while the issues around uh, getting power in a reliable and safe manner are extremely important, getting them to the customers in a, me in a method they can afford it is very important as well. Uh, and that's where you see much, much of the discussion at public utility uh, commissions as, as well. These kinds of technologies, as we've heard, even though prices are coming down on them, aren't cheap. Uh, the kind of, of, kind of full-scale, um, you know, uh, rewiring some of the other uh, activities that we're talking about here in this state and in other places uh, obviously come with a cost. And so the idea of how that cost gets spread out uh, is incredibly important as well. You are creating opportunities, as we talked about, for customers to reduce costs. And so how that gets played out is very important. But you also have to recognize that there are certain power loads and certain consumers who won't necessarily be able to take advantage of all of the different opportunities that you have. And so uh, we have to be aware of those cost shifting uh, ideas uh, and issues as they arise uh, as well. So 
consumer uh, education, we're seeing it now with, uh, with our um, competitive power market. Uh, we're seeing people start to have those kind of, of uh, water cooler discussions with coworkers about who you know, one may have signed up for in terms of a power generation company. That starts to happen. I have no doubt that the same thing would, would happen here. You talk, when they're talking about the, the kids, I thought it was pretty funny because in terms of consumer education, there's a couple of things that, that were going through my mind that both had to do with, with telecom and some of all the changes that we've seen. Uh, and if you're as old as I am, you've seen lots of changes uh, in telecom over the years. I can remember being in college uh, and making sure that, uh, that I waited until 11 o'clock at night uh, to, to call my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, at home because the rates were cheaper and they went down substantially and that was very important for us to do. That kind of education got around. We certainly all knew it in the dorm, you know, what time the, the, the phone rates went down. But at the same time, when I was part of the committee and we were talking about electric utility restructuring here in Illinois, and we were looking at consumer trends that, that uh, were, were, were present in terms of telecom at the time, and deregulation had happened for, um, for telephones uh, uh, sometime before that, so you'd had a lot of experience with it. And at that time, we found that, that over half the, the consumers uh, had not only not changed from an incumbent carrier to another, not necessarily surprising, but the vast majority of those who hadn't switched of that half uh, also hadn't even taken advantage of other payment plans or other cheaper rate plans that their own incumbent carrier was providing at the time. They just kept what they had and plowed forward with it. And so I think that's instructive for us as we talk about you know, the, the, juxta, the juxtaposition of those two uh, different little anecdotes because it's very important for us to understand that while everybody here in this room uh, and probably most of the people that we talk to on a regular basis understand this uh, and are looking forward to it and are already thinking of the different ways that they may be able to take advantage of that. There's a huge consumer education part of this that we're going to have to do because everybody isn't necessarily uh, the folks who are, who are in the room. So we know that Smart Grid will have infusions of, of private capital in addition to ratepayer supplied funds. Uh, and regulators uh, like us have to not only ensure that we've done what we can in terms of the educational components, but we also have to ensure that those two uh, sets of funds interact appropriately and that the risk, burden, and benefits are, are allocated equitably. Uh, that doesn't sound easy, and I think it's even harder than it, than it sounds. Uh, we have to strike that appropriate balance, though. And I think if we do that, and we do that in the right way, uh, that, that not only are we going to continue to our leadership role here in the Midwest uh, and that we're going to be able to find new and better uh, and even better than we're even thinking about today applications of how smart grid technology can be used, but we're going to do that in a way uh, that, that uh, is beneficial to consumers as well as to the companies that supply the power. And so I think that well, all of us have a, have a role to play in that and it's very important for us as we move forward to make sure that everybody's at the table everybody has a say because in that way we not only will get the word out better but we'll devise a better program and keep the Midwest in a leadership role. Thanks very much. Uh, great presentation Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. This concludes this morning's uh, plenary session. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending the session but before you leave I just want to point out that this is just the beginning of a great two days of a great uh, like symposium. Additional information is given in the program handouts that you should have received when you walked in. Uh, also, before you leave, I'd like to uh, mention a few names and thank people who had major roles in organizing this event. I want to thank my colleagues here at IIT in particular my colleague at the Gallagher Center, Andrew Barbeau, who spent countless hours in organizing the sessions. Uh, the Midwest Governors Association, Illinois Science and Technology Coalition, Galvin Electricity Initiative, Citizens Utility Board, Environmental Defense Fund, Clean Energy Trust, uh, UL, SNC Electric, Northwestern University, Argonne National Lab, Sierra Club, and the Illinois Manufacturing Extension Center. Also, I want to give a special thanks to our sponsors, Comet, Ethan Corporation, GE, Silver, 
Spring Networks, and the Joyce Foundation. We will have uh, two tracks that are going to start at 10.30. First one is on the Midwest Policy Summit. It's going to be in the Expo Center of the door at, uh, to your right, and then you go through the exhibits. Please make sure that you uh, pay some attention to great exhibits that we have as part of this conference. Um, we also have a track on uh, consumers, consumer track, which is called the Path to Perfect Power. It will be showcasing microgrid and other consumer-centric approaches that are improving reliability and environmental performances. Uh, there are going to be organizers in the hallway to answer any questions that you have. Uh, we are going to reconvene um, at 12 o'clock. And then we're going to have the luncheon executive panel featuring uh, Anne Promojore, uh, Michael Nigley, and uh, Terry Arvinasen. In the afternoon, we also have an exciting innovation marketplace uh, business leadership roundtable. Great event. And we will have uh, a great presentation in addition to tracks again on Midwest Policy Summit and the Perfect Power. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank you for your participation and look forward to seeing you for the next two days. Thank you very much. Thank you.